My objectives today are to apply current data from clinical trials for A1C goal setting and individualization of treatment, discuss the indication, side effects, and cost effectiveness of the newest drugs for type 2 diabetes, explain the importance of timely initiation of drug therapy, including early insulin initiation, reducing the complications of type 2 diabetes. So I have a rather uh, robust uh, over, uh, list of things I want to cover, and I'll try to get them in. I'll try, I promise not to talk too fast. Since I've been down here, I've slowed down a little bit. I've seen Yankees talk a little fast. But these are the areas I would like to uh, talk about. So I think everyone in this room knows there's an epidemic of diabetes, and that every year we're getting close to about 2 million people being diagnosed in the U.S. with diabetes. We have about 26 million. It's now about 8% of the population. And this time, uh, US, in the U.S., seniors over 65, diabetes is about 27%. And as you know, the rates are much higher for minorities. So if you look at eastern North Carolina, we're kind of near the center of the storm. This, by the way, was uh, from Hurricane Floyd. I, about a year after I got here, I went through that. <laughs> but it's not just the U.S. In fact, there's a worldwide diabetes tsunami, and that was the word used by the president of the International Diabetes Federation. And what this slide shows you is each country, the number of people in 2011 with diabetes, so for example, North, this is the whole North American continent, so it's by continent, rather. So about 38 million uh, in 2011, and it's going to be 51 million in 2030. That's a 51% increase. Uh, you can see 60% in South America. Well, there was a very low one in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, but now that's 90%. Mideast, 83%. Europe, 22%. Uh, and the worst is in Asia, a 69% increase. There's over a million people with diabetes in China, and probably that many in India as well. So this is a worldwide problem. And when I first got in this field 37 years ago, this was not at all like this. And why this is happening is for another lecture. I want to talk about mechanisms of type 2 diabetes and how those mechanisms drive us to find drugs that are work in specific ways for patients. So I'll talk about insulin secretory dysfunction, resistance, endogenous glucose production, deranged adipocyte biology, and the incretin effect. So if you look at the original thought was, what we have is a problem with decreased insulin secretion and increased glucagon secretion. And we have increased hepatic glucose production and decreased peripheral uh, uptake in the muscle. But it's become more complicated than that. We now know that fat is really very important. It's metabolically active. Free fatty acids and triglycerides trigger a lot of these things. We know now that the gut has an incretin effect, GLP-1 primarily, also GIP, one that is diminished, that exacerbates these problems. And we even know the brain is involved. There's actually one drug now that actually works through the brain. So if you look at the timeline of, of type 2 diabetes, it used to start maybe at 20 or 30. It's starting younger and younger. And so let's just say, for example, a patient's diagnosed at 0.0 and they're 40 years old. Maybe for 20 years they've already had insulin resistance, and that insulin resistance has caused stimulation of the beta cells in response to it. And as long as there's enough insulin made, then you don't get diabetes. But once you start to have an inadequate amount of beta cell response, insulin resistance, you develop uh, first pre-diabetes, sometimes called impaired fasting or glucose intolerance, which is basically someone who's fasting, say, between 100 and 126. But then by this time, you develop overt diabetes. But notice, I want to point out, that the macrovascular complications, and to some extent the microvascular complications, will precede the overt diagnosed diabetes. So in fact, type 2 diabetes <coughs> patients, 50% of them in the UK PDS already had some complications, so including a lot of them having cardiovascular disease. So when I w you mentioned DCT. When I was in DC, I wasn't working the GW Biostatistics Center. That's sort of one direct reason I'm coming down here. I knew someone who, Dr. Pfeiffer, was with me in DCCT. And what it d did is it looked at young people, ages 13 to 39, they followed them for 10 years, and they found a dramatic decrease in microvascular complications. And, but they were young, and they didn't have heart disease. But then they followed these patients the next 10 years. And the next 10 years, what happened is there was, in fact, a decrease in macrovascular disease. And the UK PDS, a type 2 study, looking at new onset patients uh, in England, again, with the two groups, the delta wasn't much, about a 1% A1C versus 2%, did notice a decrease in macrovascular and microvascular disease. But then in the last couple of years, we've had these studies, the core, the advance of the VA study, and they say, okay, well, it does increase microvascular, but no change in macrovascular, maybe even increased mortality in the core. So why is this? This is a very important thing to understand why. 
Well, if you look at the UK PDS, they were newly diagnosed. Their A1C was 7.1 in the onset. They very few had any heart disease. Where in these studies, they were all in their 60s, and they had had diabetes 10 years about or so. Their A1Cs were between 7.5 and, and 9.4, and about 30, 40% already had heart disease. So you were looking at basically two different populations. So I think this is the most important slide to understand. So when you look at the UK PDS population, the patients are here without complications. They're starting on good control. They keep the A1C fine. So now you're talking about year 11. Why is that important? Well, if you look at the other studies, the, the Accord and, and the VA and the advanced study, they didn't start until patients had an average of 10 years diabetes. So during this time of poor control, you have this buildup of this bad metabolic memory changes the DNA in the cells, which then is going to be irreversible. And then what happens is you put these people in tight control. Yes, you can bring the A1C down, but the complications continue. It's almost like I tell patients, well, you're, when you're young, you're bad, you sin, and now you're good, you go to church every week, but you're still going to hell. And that is, <laughs> <laughs> and there is a basis for that. There is a real biochemical basis for that. And that is mechanism of hyperglycemia on free radicals. So what happens is hyperglycemia gives you this superoxide anion, this free radical, and you form something called AGE, A-G-E-S, advanced glycated end products. And then here you have the reactive oxygen species, and then this, what these things do is they work on the nucleus and they damage the nucleus. And they also, have, through this, en uh, this enzyme here, GAPDH, uh, as well. So what's happening here is an FKB. All these things are damaging cells. Here's another way to look at it. So this is a vicious cycle of the metabolic memory. You see here, you've got this re reactive oxygen species in a cycle. And this leads to epigenetic changes in the endothelium, vascular signaling problems, and this leads to all the complications. So, they, in, for example, they've done these same things in animals. You take a rat with streptococcus and make him diabetic for two months. Then you make him normal glucose for the next time. And any abnormalities of complications in the endothelium, the first two months reverse. If you make him diabetic, you don't treat it for six months, and then you do it, it doesn't happen. So no longer, the animal studies have shown the same thing the human studies is. If you wait too long, the complications won't go back. So this has a great importance for how we treat diabetes because if you wait too long, if we don't see them until they had 10 years of diabetes, we're not going to be able to reverse their complications. And for years, I've had people come to me, have all these complications ready, and they expect me to fix them. You can't fix them. So in fact, we have to really push this thing back to our colleagues in pediatrics because get the people young before we see them with these problems. Here's just a clear-cut demonstration of this fact. So remember I said the VA study did not demonstrate a difference. However, the VA did a sub-study with the calcium scores. So here's the calcium scores of four groups of patients. Zero calcium, which is the best, uh, zero, one to 100, 100 to 400, over 400. You see the ones had high calcium scores, there was no change, no delta, between the people with intensive insulin and the people who were on standard control group. However, notice the people with the low calcium scores, it did have a difference. Again, confirming what I mentioned about the metabolic memory, you get them early, you can actually prevent this, and it, it, then it makes sense. But to bring light here is going to be too late. And this is why, if you take away nothing in this talk, is you can't be, as a physician, you can't just be glucocentric. You have to, you have to look at lipids, blood pressure, uh, smoking, and other risk factors. So up until last year, this was the algorithm that I was using. This was the AD algorithm. And it was kind of, you know, put in my metformin, that doesn't work, do this, do this, do this, and they end up on insulin. Well, the ADA has changed all this this year, and that's the whole point of the talk. But again, what I've, the background, I think, is very important to understand that. So they now have this position statement, and it's not an algorithm. But basically, it's called managed care, a patient-centered approach. And the idea is to calibrate treatment targets the patient needs, acknowledge lifestyle prior to metformin, individualized options, harmonize five options after metformin, and talks about initially A1C over 9, you should probably go to insulin, endorse triple therapy, which is much more aggressive than they did before. And it also involves the patient. And the idea is that you need to get a patient responsive to you and to your treatment, and that patient's going to be involved in the decision, setting an A1C goal and using the drugs. And the things that may change the goals are going to be whether they're more highly motivated, less highly motivated, whether, whether they're more risk or, or less risk for hypoglycemia, how long they have the disease, life expectancy, uh, they have comorbidities or vascular things, 
And do they have the resources and support network to give them the most aggressive and best therapy? So in fact, an A1C with less than seven is appropriate for young people, maybe even six and, six and a half is appropriate, but for older people or people with more comorbidities, you might need to make that A1C target eight or even maybe eight and a half, but certainly there's a lot of people seven and a half. So I think what you need to do in your clinics now is you see a patient, decide what your A1C target is going to be for that patient and put it in the record and have this is our target. And say your target is, a lot of my patients now, under seven and a half without hypoglycemia because that's the, that is the, the biggest bugaboo is hypoglycemia. So that this just shows you the target. And again, individualization the key and avoidance of hypoglycemia. This is the main take-home message of this position statement. So in the position statement, they referenced an article in the BMJ that I thought was very interesting. It says, we need minimally disruptive medicine. The burden of treatment for many people with complex chronic comorbidities reduces the capacity to collaborate and care. And you know, an average 65-year-old takes 10 different classes of medications for, that has diabetes, 10 different types of ketone, blood pressure medicine, lipid, and so forth. So they want to establish a way to burden, encourage coordination clinical practice, acknowledge comorbidity clinical evidence, and prioritize. And here's an example they gave. In the U.S., a primary care doctor referred a man in his 50s with type 2 diabetes and a raised A1C to an endocrinologist noting insufficient glycemic control with max dose of metformin and glipizide. Endocrinologist added pioglitazone and max the dose, no response. Then he tried exenatide, no response. A year after starting that, the endocrinologist saw the patient was even higher than ever. So then he offered to put him on insulin, glargine insulin. The patient complained drugs were too expensive. A review of his pharmacy records indicated he had never he had ever filled the prescriptions for the drugs. So this is why we have to, this is why it's so important to understand that in this case cost can be a real problem for some of our patients. And it also means that you as a physician need a team. You need people on your team. You need dietitians. You need uh, diabetes educators, nurses. Uh, you need um, other pharmacists, other people, social workers to help get the patient the care they need to, to manage this disease. So it is important. We're going to talk about drugs the rest of the talk, but we do have to talk about exercise. Here's people going the escalator up to the gym. <laughs> Here's people walking the dog. And we can, since we're in Eastern North Carolina, we have to talk about food. Here's a few favorites, as you know. And then, of course, you have, um, uh, we've got to get rid of that. And you have now the, the, the healthy plate here. And so here's a question for you. How many calories in this set of French fries here? You want to guess? Try 610. So an average person has to walk uh, two and a half, 30, 130 pound person has to walk almost two and a half hours to burn off the difference between two French fries. So, this has gotten to be a problem, and if you read this headline in the New England Journal, that there's now bad, and, you, if you, and if you follow Mayor Bloomberg in New York, who's banned these big soft drinks, I mean, this is real stuff. And the effect in shows here is a genetic association with adiposity more pronounced with greater intake of sugar-sweetened sugar beverages. So people are maybe genetically more prone to problems with a high fructose corn syrup and large amounts of this stuff. So we could talk a whole lecture on this, but I just want to remember that you cannot, no matter what drugs you do, successfully treat people with diabetes especially type two, if you don't manage the nutrition and hopefully some exercise. So we'll talk about the drugs now. So when I was, uh, I went to medical school in 1967 and the big new drug when I was in school was the beta blockers. And then about, you see about every 10 years, the hypertension class has grown. So that by about, nine, about maybe 2000 or so, we have 11 classes of hypertension. Diabetes was kind of felt to be a, you know, the Ronnie Dangerfield of uh, medicine. We had insulin, of course, in the 1920s, a great breakthrough. We had sulfonylureas in the 50s, then we had biguanides, and I treated several people as a resident with lactic acidosis. They took that off the market and uh, conforming. Then we back now to two, two classes of drugs, until about right here. And a lot of people didn't stop their training before that. What's happened in the last five years? Now 11 class of drugs. So it's no wonder primary care doctors are confused about which drugs to use, who needs to, and why should you take them, what goes with what. And if it gets worse, as I'll show you right here, yeah, last night, 5 o'clock, FDA approves cannabis flow. So we got a new, approved, right, board recommended. So we probably, we, so we have a new class of drugs. We actually did a study on that. If we have time later, I'll talk about it. So now it's going to be 12 class of drugs. So these are all the classes. We don't use all these classes, but I think as a resident, you need to know about them, understand them, because you may have patients who are on them, and some may be better than others, and there's a lot of reasons to pick. But you see, it's hard. It's all like going to the grocery store in 1950 versus today. You go to the grocery store, buy a box of cereal, you had, what, four choices. Now you have hundreds of choices. So I think it's become more difficult. The good news is we have better drugs, 
But the bad news is it's become more difficult for physicians to, to decide which drugs to give. So what you want to consider is how effective is the drug? Is it safe? Does it cause hypoglycemia? What about weight? Does it keep on working? What about renal function? Do you have to adjust or, or limit during renal yeah, problems? What if, does it change cardiovascular risk or lipids? How is it given? Is it synergistic? And how much does it cost? So all these things are important because things like cost, as I mentioned with that case, affect, it, it affect adherence, and side effects affect adherence. So now I want to change tracks and just review for you what you may not remember, which is what is an incretin, because it's a whole group of drugs that re rely on incretins. The word incretin is an acronym for intestinal secretion of insulin. These are gut-derived factors that increase insulin secretion when you eat, so they're glucose-stimulated. And the most important one is GLP-1, which comes from the small intestine. So if you, if you give a non-diabetic person glucose orally, you see it comes from about 90, maybe to about 150, comes back down within two hours, and the C-peptide's pretty good. Now, if you give the same amount of carbohydrate intravenously, you'll notice the glucose is identical. However, the insulin is much less robust, and this difference between the two is the incretin effect. And that is this GLP-1 made by the L cells of the ileum. It, it does these things. It stimulates insulin secretion, suppresses glucagon, delays gastric empathy, <coughs> enhances satiety, and, and may affect beta cells. That's, that's controversial. So in both type, uh, type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes, there are decreased levels of GLP-1. So could, why not just give people GLP-1? And you can do that. And so GLP-1, by the way, has effects, and maybe actually be cardioprotective, it's not sure, but it has effects on other organs, but particularly, you mentioned the muscle, the liver, gut, and the brain. So this uh, little, tried to make this cover up the millimoles, put in milligrams for you. So if you look at a controlled person here, glucose is about 100, they eat a meal, goes up, goes up here. Then you'll come with diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Uh, you see an untreated person, blood sugar starts high, goes up with meal, and so forth. If you just give it an infusion of GLP-1, it almost normalizes it. But the problem is with GLP-1, it's broken down by this enzyme, DPP-4. So it has a very, very short half-life. That's why you can't use GLP-1. So how do you get around it? Well, a guy named Dr. Eng figured out that if you could take GLP-1 from a Gila monster, uh, that would, uh, they wouldn't be recognized and broken down, and that's how they came up with the first drug, which was exenatide. So that is basically using a uh, naturally occurring GLP-1 analog with a long half-life. Uh, then the folks at, um, at uh, Novo Nordisk took uh, uh, their uh, GLP-1 and added fatty acids to it so it won't be broken down. So this is loragotide, this is exenatide. And the other way is if you block this enzyme, your own native GLP-1 hangs around longer. And this is how they've got around the problem of the short half-life of GLP-1. So let's just kind of, kind of briefly go through the drugs. The GLP-1 agonists, aragotide and uh, genotide here, the train names. These work very well for obese people, more recent onset. They work well with metformin. They are expensive. Contraindications, people with gastroparesis, CKD3 through 5, uh, medullary carcinoma of thyroid, uh, history of pancreatitis. And you have to be careful if they're on sulfonylureas or insulin uh, for hypoglycemia. Now, the DP4s, there's now three of them. There's more probably coming. And these are not as potent as the GLP-1 agonists. They're oral, which is good. They don't cause the nausea you get with GLP-1 agonists. Uh, but they're still almost as expensive, but they're not as potent. So, so you want to look at the A1C. And you see, basically, metformin, sulfonylurea, TZD, decrease A1C 1 to 2%. The GLP-1 agonists could be like 1.5%. The DP4 is about 0.7%. They're not as strong. This is shown in this slide here. And when you start off with a higher A1C, of course, you get better bang for your buck. But here's the, here's the uh, exenatide and here's the compared to the other drugs. But they are very, very, uh, work very well in conjunction. Uh, they're synergistic with metformin. So both GLP-1 and uh, DB4s work well with metformin. So this shows you this chart and the, from pharmacist's letter showing each of the different classes and, and weight gain versus weight loss and, and the A1C reduction. So we don't want hypoglycemia. So what causes hypoglycemia? Insulin, sulfonylurea, mugglutinides. And some of these have names. You would not know what DUACT is, but that drug has a sulfonylurea in it, so you have to be careful. And we've had several patients in this hospital admitted with severe hypoglycemia with renal disease on sulfonylurea, so you've got to be careful of that. Uh, uh, metformin, of course, you know there's concern. And what, 
the, the PDR says 1.5 for men, 1.4 for women. We followed what the UK says, UK and other countries do. That is, metformin safe with GFR under 45, uh, under 45 may reduce the dose. And, and in fact, it's probably stop it at 30. So we're using metformin now if people GFR is down to 30. Uh, and it's been, usually it's very safe. Um, other problems, of course, insulin, you have to lower the dose of CKD. TZD is a bad with nephrotic syndrome. Incretin drugs cannot be used. Uh, the DP4s, GLP1s rather, cannot be used at GFR less than 30. The DP4s are dose de uh, dependent, and you can then, except for the one with gluptin, which is the same for everybody, so you can give DP4s safely, even people with end stage renal disease. Congestive heart failure, major problem with TZDs. Metformin has been approved if people have for stable heart failure, but it's unstable, you shouldn't give it. So this is other concerns that we have. So in this ADA position statement, they talk about in quite a bit of depth, and you really should read the article, it's like about 12 to ages, but it's very good, about all these things that help us decide which drugs to give, and I've mentioned some of them already. Uh, again, and what your A1C target's gonna be? So a lot of focus on drug safety. So what about our weight? So of course, you know, we have people that we send to bariatric surgery, which is, I think, appropriate for a lot of people. Um, and we have paper, and we want to try to avoid the weight gain from insulin, and we by using metformin with it. We use metformin almost every type two patient, unless there's a contraindication, helps prevent some of that weight gain. The GLP-1 agonists cause weight loss. They, I've had people lose 70 pounds very successfully. Most lose 10, 20 pounds. If you see a linear patient, they may be a type one in disguise, so called LADAS. Here's a study that was just presented at the at AESAD uh, in 2012. This is very interesting. A Swedish study. The main finding is that people in their first year after diagnosis of type 2 diabetes with a one, in, one, one BMI unit increase had a 63% higher cardiovascular mortality. So this is, that's, that's very significant for one. So the point of the matter is that you really want it not to cause weight gain in people who have, uh, when you start treatment with diabetes. Uh, now, Eastern Asian patients uh, have less beta cell uh, function. Uh, Latinos have more insulin resistance. Uh, there's a thing, there are MODIs, is a rare kind of form that responds best to salt on ureas. But so there may be gender and genetic differences as well. Other considerations, I mentioned comorbidities, uh, coronary artery disease, metformin may have a, seems to have a benefit. Metformin really seems to, to actually prevent coronary artery disease or delay or exacerbation of it a little bit. Avoid hypoglycemia. There's some concern <coughs> sulfonylureas ureas cause, uh, interfere with ischemic preconditioning. One study showed people with their own decreased cardiovascular events. Uh, Infratins are up in the air, but maybe okay. Uh, liver function, uh, most tests, tests, t t uh, drugs do not test advanced liver disease. As you know, the, the TCD group, PPARS, actually can help people with steatosis, but insulin is your best option. <coughs> so this is what it looks like. It's not exactly easy like the other one, but you see here they've got metformin and they've got your options. If metformin doesn't work, then you go on to a second drug or a third drug, and here's insulin. And they say, these are your, you know, this is a kind of, you have to read this yourself to go through all this. They do say when that one, you know, when A1C is greater than 9%, go with dual therapy or insulin, especially the A1C is 10%, and it gets more complicated. This is a summary of the whole thing from a uh, prescriber's letter, just to show you, but it is, there is a way you can use it algorithmically. But again, which one, you get all the options, which one are you going to choose? So again, reviewing the position statement, diet, exercise, education, the foundation, unless contraindicated, metformin is the optional first-line drug, uh, is the optimal, rather, optimal first-line drug. After metformin, there's really no good data which ones work best. I think you want to do based on the patient, based on your goal, and based on all things we just talked about. And keeping in mind that 80% of people with diabetes die from cardiovascular disease. So there's some alternative uh, options to the ADA ESAD a position statement. I'll show them briefly. This is the ACE group. What the ACE group does, something a little unique, and they've done this for quite a while. They take patients and they put, first of all, they try to have a goal of A1C less than six and a half. And they say if you're six and a half to seven and a half, start with one drug, seven and a half to nine, two drugs, over nine, three drugs, and then they go to three or four drugs and insulin. It gets pretty complicated. I think it makes some sense, uh, but it's another way you can uh, approach and give you some guidance on what you want to do with these patients but there's no study to prove it. There actually is a study we tried to get here called the GRADE study, where the NIH is gonna look at people taking multiple drugs at first, like the ACE algorithm versus the old 2008 ADA algorithm to see in fact, if you keep the A1C down, there's less complications. And based on what I showed you earlier, I think that is probably gonna help. That's what we really need to do. You can't just 
treat it with one drug and they get bad and wait another few years, another one. I think that, that just doesn't work. And it's somewhat similar to difficult hypertension cases. How about ACP? Basically, ACP says use generic medication. That's basically what it says. I, I have no problem with that. <laughs> so, and it is true because these drugs, I mean, some of these drugs are $8 a day. This is very expensive. These are very expensive drugs. May not expensive uh, uh, given rheumatology or an oncology, but these can be quite expensive for patients. And that increased the burden that I mentioned before. So let's go over to insulin now. The biggest problem, I think, and I, I felt this way in, in 37 years of, of practicing diabetes, is that primary care doctors tend to wait too long to start insulin, and they wait longer. And you can see here that the more they, they wait, then they're going to have higher A1Cs. So the A1C uh, tends to be uh, the A1C tends to be about uh, 8.9 when insulin is given. So they, we call this problem clinical inertia. And I think it's because, well, we think the patients don't want insulin, and you know, they're gonna give you hassle. And I think, from, I think before the advent of the newer basal insulins and the pens, it was very hard for primary care doctors to give them NPH insulin with a syringe and a vial and try to teach that safely. But now with glucose monitoring, now with these pens, it's made it much easier and the insulins are very easy to start. So when do you start insulin type two patients? Uh, you, the, the ADA still recommends what they call severely uncontrolled diabetes, and that is patients who have uh, a, a fasting over 250, a random over 300, A1C over 10, and symptomatic. These need, people need insulin right away. Now, if you can stabilize them, maybe later they get off insulin, but they need good insulin very, very quickly. When else is to give insulin? Well, when the orals uh, or the other injectables are not working, you can't, there are side effect problems when they have advanced renal and liver disease. Uh, people on steroids, most oral agents can, cannot overcome steroids. Infection, people in the hospital should be taken off. We recommend in our hospital program, no oral agents, put them on insulin. We recommend IV insulin for all the ICUs. And, and we have now endotool in almost all the ICUs, now MIU. Um, so when you have patients who are sick in the ICU, when you get in high dose steroids, uh, you need to really um, to give them insulin uh, in the hospital. And when you have an infect, patient with infection, you can actually you, you give insulin. In fact, back in 1925 in Banting's lecture, he noted, now this is 30 years before antibiotics, that patients who had wounds that did not heal with type 2 diabetes were put on insulin. This was old insulin, and their wounds actually started to heal. So they actually showed evidence that in surgical patients you could heal wounds without antibiotics a long time ago. So we have a long track record in the surgical patient of trying to avoid infection. We know that better control promotes wound healing. In pregnancy, we almost always use insulin. In the hospital, we do, and again, I mentioned severely controlled diabetes. So, what are the factors? You know, well, this was a study. How willing are patients to just take insulin? Well, almost half of them, no problem. You say, doctor, I'll do it. Uh, and then 17%, I don't really want to do this, and then somewhere ambivalent. So, really, it's not as, as bad as you think it's going to be. So, there are barriers. So, these are the patient barriers. Many times, people think, I went on insulin, I did this my fault. I didn't follow my diet. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. You know, and that may not be true at all, because as I mentioned before, there is a loss of beta cell function in time, and that's not, you should tell them that, I tell people when I start on oral agents, you know, eventually you probably will be on insulin. They need to kind of know that from the get-go, and you don't hold insulin over their head as like a punishment if they did bad. You have to explain this is part of what you have to do as a disease changes. Your disease in 1995 is going to be different in 2000 and so forth. Um, there are causes, people are concerned about hypoglycemia, they think that a shot may lose their independence. And they think, then they say, well, you know, my aunt Sally went on insulin, and then they, she went on dialysis, or Uncle Henry went on insulin, and they cut his leg off. And of course, as we know, half of these people had long standing diabetes, poorly controlled. They put on insulin then, and it was, it was too late. As we mentioned, the metabolic memory, all this stuff went ahead, and that, and that gives misconceptions to people. And that's what they hear at the grocery store, the hair dryer, hairdresser. Okay. So these are these, so we, and now, again, things about needles and pain. These little needles, they have the pen needles now are four millimeters. That hurts much less than to prick your finger to a blood test. So really, it's easy. The hypoglycemia, there's ways we can reduce it, and we teach them how to recognize and treat it. Weight gain, I've already mentioned, and cost, of course, is we, we discuss that a little bit. Physician barriers are clinical inertia, an, an under, misunderstanding about insulin dosing. This is a major problem. We looked at hypoglycemia at our hospital here, and, and, and uh, written, orders written by hospitalists and residents, and we, we found three causes of hypoglycemia, and one-third was the doctor gave way too much insulin. Another third was a logistical problem. The patient got insulin, went off to radiology or something. Another third people with renal disease. So those are the reasons they get hypoglycemia. So a lot of doctors don't understand that insulin is weight-based, 
And, and type 1 patients need about 0.5 unit per kilogram, and type 2 need, can need more, and they have to understand that, and CKD patients need less. And the blue books, which we're revising, by the way, has all that in it to help you, guide you with your inpatient stuff. Uh, weight gain is an issue, and there's no question about it. We have to try to minimize weight gain, as I showed you with that talk, that, that, that slide from the Swedish obesity study. And there are non-adherence things where people don't fill their prescriptions. I mentioned they don't stay on it, and there are many reasons for non-adherence, and we have to address these. And again, having your diabetes educator with you can help overcome that. Uh, find the obstacles and try to get them to not coerce them. So I, I have never had a patient yet I couldn't get to take insulin shot with a pen because it's so easy. If they won't do it, I just give it to them. I said, oh, that doesn't hurt, does it? And then they have them do it. Really? So needle phobia is, is, should not be a problem. And starting once a day is a lot easier uh, than having to start multiple injections. Okay. So how do you start insulin? I think you may have heard this before, but typically we give 0.2 units per kilogram in the outpatient setting, and we titrate the dose in a treat-to-target setting. That is, you have to do, I have to say, take you know, 10 units of glargine or 20 units of glargine, and have to do their fasting three days in a row. If two out of three fasting, they're above the target, then they would increase like one or two units. And you give them a program like that, it works very, very well. They cut back if they get low blood sugar. And this is what these studies show, treat the target. And notice the NPHs actually will get the best, same A1C as, as analog glargine. Same, same A1C. The difference is in hypoglycemia. That's the big difference. Because you get more hypoglycemia when you give NPH, especially at night um, or before supper particularly, than you do with the analog insulin. So then what happens, and the biggest problem now, so primary care doctors are doing a better job of starting insulin. Not as good as they should, but better. So what happens to the basal insulin and it's not working? When you give them a decent dose of basal and their fasting's good, now you've got to figure out what the problem is. The problem usually is the postprandial. So for postprandial glucose, you have to optimize your oral drugs. And you may have to do one of the things. One thing you could do is that is short-acting uh, short insulin the largest meal. We did a study here on that. We published that in endocrine practice where we gave patients either a shot. If they're failing basal, they gave them a shot with just supper only or one group, and one group with supper breakfast and one's all three meals. And with supper only, you can get a lot of people to uh, do well. Patients don't want to take a shot at work, I say, that's fine, go to work, have a salad, put chicken on it, you don't need insulin for that, there's no carbs. They have to understand they can modify their dose based on carbs, and, and if there's no carbs, even a type 1 patient does not need uh, short-acting insulin for that meal. And there's pre-mixed insulin, I'll mention a little bit. So how do these drugs work together? Well, with insulin. So metformin is absolutely synergistic, so fonirea is really not. You can use it with basal, but it's not great. Pigotin is, but has more problems with weight gain and fluid retention. The DP4s have been approved now as the GLP-1 agonists are approved with basal insulin. They're not approved with premixed insulin or multiple daily injections. So you really shouldn't be using these drugs unless you're just using the basal insulin alone. So this wants to give you some idea of A1C reduction. I hope the colors will come out. So, so this is uh, exenatide, and, the, and, the, and then this is sinagliptin and with metformin alone. So with, with insulin and metformin alone, A1C reduction, about 1%. When you do it with uh, sinagliptin, you're up. This way, I'm sorry, this is A1C reduction. A1C reduction, about 1% on metformin alone. With uh, sinagliptin, which is a DB4, about 2.5%, or 1.5%, and almost 2% when you use the exenatide and metformin insulin. So you see with basal insulin, you get the biggest bang for your buck with metformin and exenatide. Uh, in terms of hypoglycemia, uh, really all about the same, some, for some reason a little more than sinagliptin. Uh, and then in terms of weight gain, uh, metformin alone, uh, DP4s don't really have much difference, but with a, with a, a uh, GLP-1 agonist, of course, they lose weight. So that is what you, so you can now add these drugs together if the patient can afford it. How about it? Premixed insulins? Premixed insulins, they are effective, but sometimes problems. Again, hypoglycemia, particularly during the middle of the night. Here's a study comparing glargine with orals versus biphasic, and you see with the uh, premix, they actually have better A1C reduction. However, in fact, see, 66% got the A1C less than 7 versus 40% on basal only, but they had a lot more hypoglycemia and they gained a lot more weight. So that's some of the problems with premixed insulin. I really don't like premixed insulin, but for some people, that's all you can do. Uh, it's not physiologic, that's the re reason I don't like it, but we use it only when we have to. So again, I mentioned intensification. You, tr you get a target. If the, you've got your maximum, you maximize your basal, then you want to use analog at meals, and you have to come up with a target. Most targets should be to get your fasting, uh, you know, and, or pre-meals down, you know, around 130, 120, and then, and then two hours, no more than 180. 
and then you and you add from there in the basal bolus matter. So this would be this is kind of the holy grail of diabetes. You see this line here is what non-diabetics insulin looks like in response to meals. So you try to reproduce this with a long-acting insulin here in Glargine and Detmer, and then use one of the three analog insulins, Lyspro, Aspartic, and Lysin, to try to cover the meals. If they don't eat lunch, then you skip this dose right here. And that's basically the, the basal bolus, something called uh, multiple daily injection approach to diabetes, which we've used for type 1 for years, and have adapted type 2, and it works very, very successfully. Insulin pens, I mentioned, are much easier for patients. They are a little more expensive. But if they're on a low dose, actually, a pen can be cheaper. Because once you open a bottle or a pen, 30 days, that's it, you can't use it anymore. So you gotta, if you only use 10 units a day, actually the pen is cheaper. If you use 50 units a day or 60, you, the, 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 uh, the, the vials are better. So again, to summarize this, you take one to three oral agents with, uh, with the basal insulin. Um, then if that doesn't work, you add an analog and try to target your A1C. Yeah, I'm done already. We have hopefully a lot of time for questions. So, um, and if you want to talk about the SGLT2 blocker, that inhibitor, I, can, I have a few slides I can throw, throw in on that. Uh, summary, use a patient-centered approach. Uh, I should also say start early because of the metabolic memory issue. Include behavior modification, nutrition, exercise. Individualize the A1C target based on the patient's uh, resources, the patient's uh, willingness to be cooperative with you, the patient's family support. Um, uh, and their comorbidities. And follow the algorithm. You can pick the ADA or ACE. Either one is okay. If they're severely uncontrolled, use insulin from the beginning. Um, choose the oral or non-insulin injectable drugs based on multiple factors, including age, comorbidities, and cost. Prioritize therapy from the patient perspective. And this is the most important point. Do not be glucocentric. We have remember, these people are not dying from DKA or hyperosmolar states. They're dying primarily from heart disease. Uh, renal failure, infection. Those are the things that kill people with diabetes, and, and we, can, we need to address that. And in doing so, we have to worry about weight reduction, blood pressure control, lipid control, smoke cessation, and good care for complications, surveillance for complications, treated in aspirin when indicated for those people. So can you help me, doctor? Nope. Meds can only do so much as a job for Photoshop. So I'll stop right here and take some questions. Thank you very much.